You are listening to the Analuya podcast, where faith and animation collide. Each episode, we'll discuss the various topics in animated movies and TV shows, while also sharing our thoughts and opinions as they relate to faith and spirituality. Get ready to raise a hallelujah. It's time for Analuya. And you're locked into another episode of the Analuya podcast. My name is Josh, and having a bit of a laid back weekend, my wife, Rebecca. Hello, everybody. And I know that you haven't been feeling too well. It started on, what was it, like? It was a couple of days a, ago. A couple of days ago. Yeah. But she's here. She's a truther. She's turning on for a couple hours. and That's right. We're going to do this. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, just as plans for our life changes, plans for the 4th of July changes, too. Uh, yeah. We were originally going to go out, you know, this weekend. Um, but you know, um, your, your grandparents, uh, or your grandmother, uh, had, has COVID or had COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, she was sick and, um, she was like, oh, I hate to do this, but I think we're going to have to reschedule. So we will find another time to go hang out with them. Yeah. Uh, we, we've got a few family members that we want to hang out with, uh, your grandmother, uh, uh so gr grandmother Dean and, uh, Papa Joe, mm -hmm. and also, um, your aunt mm -hmm. in, in texas. texas and then of course my dad and um and his wife nicole um for i think in december christmas is what we're thinking yeah that'll be fun yeah. they're gonna have a cabin <laughs> awesome well we know we had then um bumped it up with a guest for this season and we're not disappointed we have another guest for this episode so rebecca go ahead and introduce our guest yeah, so today we have Lydia Jane. She is a, a Christian and a storyteller who loves or lives deep in the woods uh, with a wide assortment of animals. Uh, she adores tea, clean humor, especially memes, and wildlife education. Editing and writing are both huge passions of hers, and she has a deep love for the art of crafting moving, nar moving narratives. So welcome, Lydia. We're very excited to have you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I really, really appreciate this. Yeah, absolutely. And we noticed for those who are um, watching on YouTube, you can see that Lydia actually has a snake mm -hmm. um, around. So tell us about your snake. Yes, this is Pixie Peppercorn. She is my pet corn snake. She's technically what is considered a cinder morph. She's not the natural wild patterning. And pretty much a morph is just where an animal has a different, I guess, genome compared to what you would find naturally in the wild. And so you end up with a different coloration. And so she has more of these silver and muted bronze tones to her. And she's my big sweetheart. I love having her just hanging out with me when we watch like movies or when I'm just scrolling through the internet. She's, she's pretty chill. She's a lot of fun to have around though, because <laughs> she just con continually climbs on me. So yeah but she's, she's moving a lot <laughs> oh yes she's a very very active creature <laughs> that's awesome well tell us a little bit more then about your your background and um what really got you interested particularly in writing well i loved storytelling ever since i was really really small however i never really enjoyed reading books oddly enough um so i would always make up my own stories well in seventh grade I ended up getting in this elective course for a creative writing class with my teacher, Dr. Johnson. And he did this big, like short story program where we were supposed to come up with our own unique, you know, story characters world. And I ended up coming up with an entirely, you know, I guess unique fantasy world, at least in my mind at the time, all on my own. And it got me so excited and so hyped that after I wrote that short story, I was like, oh no, I got to write books. I got to turn this into a book because I was like, I want to write the kind of books I want to read because all the books that they wanted me to read in school, in my opinion, were very boring. I wanted something that had thrill, that had excitement, that had intrigue, that had drama, that had action. I was just like, I want something thrilling. And so my very first book I wrote was going to be in the fantasy genre, just because for me, fantasy was just a lot more fun than reading something contemporary or sp supposedly, I guess, literary. Because most literary books when I was in school just bored me to tears. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So what was the, did you end up actually finishing that book? Mm -hmm. I finished the first book. I'm supposed to write a second and third, but I ended up getting a little off track. So I self-published the first book when I was 17 and I ended up having a pretty rough experience in the aftermath of that because I ended up getting a lot of negative reviews mm. online. Like people were giving me like one star, two stars. The only like five star reviews I got were from family members. Mm. And that ended up really crushing my spirit. And mm. I started to constantly second guess everything I wrote. I was like, is this good enough? Is it going to be of quality? Oh, will somebody criticize this? Will somebody criticize this? And I just nitpick and nitpick and nitpick until I got to a point where I wasn't completing anything. I couldn't complete a single story. Well, okay. flash forward to now, and I'm actually getting back into it a little bit at a time. I'm finally trying to write my own stuff again. It just took a while in the aftermath of uh, just all of that. It, I don't know how I would describe it. It wasn't necessarily trauma, but it was something that was very difficult to work through. Yeah. I mean, that it, when you put your heart and soul into something particularly creative mm -hmm. and people come along and they, they stomp all over it, basically, that's like, you're like, that was, that was me on in a book and yes, you just like crushed it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's really hard. That that is traumatic, I would say, um, mm -hmm. to, yeah, to work through. I would agree with that because being a creative thing, we're all creatives, being author, editor, um, painter, videographer, podcaster, these are all like different creative outlets. And mm -hmm. when somebody just like stomps on it, gives you a bad review, negative reviews, it is very hard not to take that personal because you put so much time and effort. And again, as you said, you know, your heart into this. And it, it can it can give you a little bit of a setback and start questioning, well, am I doing this right? Is anybody gonna, gonna read this, listen to it, watch it, whatever it might be? So we definitely have experienced that in our own lives. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I find too that um, it helps a lot in a way to like disassociate yourself exactly. from what you've created yeah. and knowing that you what you create is not where your identity comes from your identity comes from your relationship with god and those special people that are around you and all of those types of things um so no, that yeah. i know that helped me it sounds like maybe that that's where you kind of came to yeah it was like you said it was a separation where you were able to see your art as being something that you just created but it wasn't a full embracement of yourself. Yeah. And that was something difficult for me because my personality is somebody, I wanna put everything out there. I wanna wear my heart on my sleeve. I want to just expose everything and just have this beautiful, wonderful experience. But that was something that was tough for me to learn in adulthood, which was how to guard your heart yeah. and how to not invest so much of your emotional and mental energy into a story, yeah. making it more clinical. and. I guess it's the same with art too. When you're going into any art form, there it has to be a clinical aspect of it where you do separate yourself because otherwise you're going to fall into a depressive funk and you're not going to be able to create because you'll constantly be trapped in that sense of imposter syndrome. Exactly. That's exactly right. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to, to work through that and that you're creating again. That's so amazing. Um, really, really exciting. <laughs> Um, so let's see, what else do we have on here? <laughs> Sorry, with all the rustling of the papers. <laughs> um, oh yeah. So you, you offer a service kind of in line with your writing, but you offer a service where you offer content editing. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that. Well, that came up as a result of a lot of things that God just put in my path. So I was working multiple jobs for a time. I didn't really have any time to write or create. And then I eventually reached a point where I was like, I want to start focusing on my writing a lot more. So I started to pull back from focusing on career stuff and started to 
just do little minor edits for friends. Like I had a missionary friend who asked me to edit her newsletter. Um, I had friends who were still in college and they were asking for help with their papers and everything I edited on, they were getting A's back. They were getting good reviews back. So I was like, yeah, okay, this is kind of fun. This is kind of interesting. Well, then I found out that one of the girls that I went to high school with, Vanessa Romas, who goes by Vanessa Burton now, had self-published a book and she was trying to get it out there and she wasn't really having much success getting it going. And I was like, Hey, do you want me to take a look at your book? I I've never really tried to edit before, but I would love to take a look at it and see if I might have some positive feedback or feedback to help you shape the story in a different direction. Cause she was also trying to pitch it and she wasn't getting much success with getting people to pick it up. So I went through the book and that's where I started to develop my, I guess, my editing voice. Because when you're talking about content editing, developmental editing, each developmental editor has a different method. That's something I've learned. It's not like with copy editing where people just look for grammar and spelling. With developmental editing, you're pretty much trying to get into the author's head, into their voice, and you're trying to connect uh, between the author and the reader in such a way to where the story meets the reader's expectations, but still stays true to the author's voice, which is very, very subjective. So <laughs> every developmental editor I've ever met has a different method. And mine is more so from, I guess, the perspective of how I used to critique my own writing after the, in the aftermath of those bad reviews. I was like, okay, so I know someone's going to critique this. Let's see how we can reshape this to make it stronger. Then I also took creative writing courses pretty much all throughout high school, all throughout college. I was like, these are tips and techniques I learned from my professors. We'll start applying them here, like showing instead of telling or increasing the pacing, increasing the tension, finding ways to make the story more interesting. Because I don't know if you've had this experience where you pick up a book and the first chapter is so dull. You're like, okay, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying. You read to the next chapter and nothing's happened. Oh no, I'm going to keep trying. And then you're about 50 pages in and nothing's happened. And you're like, I don't know if I can finish this book. I'm so bored. So those are things that I would start to throw in like, hey, let's add in a bit of conflict here. Let's add in the point of where the, where the um, plot is actually going to take hold. We need something to happen here. And so I went through all of Vanessa's book. I did that and I did all my suggestions. She applied them and then she pitched it and she got a contract. And I was like, hmm, that was actually kind of fun. I might try that again. So I started picking up internships. I did an internship with Monster Ivy Publishing. I did an internship with, um, oh, oh what, what is it? Illuminate, who is with uh, Lighthouse LLC, I think but with Illuminate YA fiction. And I just kept doing these internships just for fun. I was editing just for fun and I was loving it. And I continue to edit even now and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I, it, it brings me so much joy. I, I can't explain it. It's just like, it clicks. Editing just makes sense to me. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that you're saying, talking about every editor kind of has their own voice because mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's driving the story in in a different direction or in the direction, you know, that the author would want, but also the readers want, mm -hmm. that's gotta be really difficult. Oh yes. yes yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know I mean, I've definitely had those experiences too, where I've read a book and I'm like, this is so dry. I'm not sure I can continue with this. And I'm pretty sure there's been some books that I'm just like, nope, I can't. And you put it down. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's so important to have those, those sort of third party come in and look at those stories to say, okay, here's where I think we can improve. You've done great, but you know, what if we did this and this and kind of get to be a part of the creative process? That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that is also the hardest part too, though, is because it is so subjective. Yeah. You run into the issue of the matter that I experienced where you put so much of your heart in the story. Mm -hmm. You can run into a matter where an author starts to feel defensive or hurt. And it's like, no, 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 I'm not trying to attack you. It's just that the story is weak here and we need to improve it. And that's something that is difficult when you're working with 
an author is if the author takes a personal offense at what you suggest. That's why I try to always phrase my suggestions in a way to where they know that it's not a personal attack on them. It's supposed to just help them reorder their mind or I guess re-envision the scene so that they can find a better way to improve it because something is wrong. And if my suggestion doesn't fit, we can still find something that will. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And what a unique perspective you have too, particularly because of your experience where you know what it's like to feel attacked. You can phrase it in such a way that you can help that person along to say, okay, no, this is this is not an attack on you like you were just saying. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what an awesome place that, that God has you. And, um, and I know that I, you were talking with Josh, I think, um, before we met here today, and you said that you actually offer your services as a, um, like a ministry opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Tell us a little bit about that. Yep. I do all of my, uh, editing for charity. Um, if somebody comes to me looking for content editing, I'm, my only request is for either a child sponsorship, or if that is beyond, I guess, what they can afford, a donation to a Christian ministry. I am looking to serve Christ through my work. And so that's the only thing I request is that they would do it for charity so that someone else is blessed for the ministry of Christ through what I'm doing. Because editing for me is just a fun hobby. It keeps my mind active. It helps me also with my own writing. So it's I gain so much from it that I don't feel the need to ask for money. And I would also much rather have somebody else who is hungry or thirsty or in need get something that they need instead of just extra money for me to just spend on, well, you know, something fun. It, it makes, it feels more fulfilling if that makes sense. That's Absolutely. such an interesting uh, business model. I mean, oh, we love that. You don't see too many um, editors or editing services that do it for charity there may be a business model where like oh yeah a percentage of the proceeds will go to whatever i mean this is for what it sounds like is a hundred percent of what is done yep. will go to help charities or help the sponsor a child yep yep yeah i mean that's honestly what i wanted out of it because i was when i actually started getting into being contracted as a professional editor because i did have a few companies give me professional contracts you don't make a whole ton of money. <laughs> There's not a whole ton of money in royalties off of books. And that's honestly something I tell a lot of authors too, when you go in, don't go in it for the money. I mean, if you do your, I mean, you might, there is a chance the Lord might bless it and you might see a lot of money, but don't go in it for the money. Go in it because you love the art of storytelling. Go in it because you love your story. Go in it because you want to network with other people and with other readers. And when I realized, I was like, there's not a whole lot of money here. And I would much rather this money go to somebody else who needs it because what might not be a whole lot of money for me would be a whole lot of money for someone else in desperate need. So I was like, we're going to do this 100% charity. It's the best way to do it, in my opinion. And I, I have no regrets. I absolutely love it. And every single time I edit a manuscript, there is a sense of peace when I'm going in too, because it's like, this is going to help someone else. This mean, And it means a lot to me. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Um. So we talked a little bit about uh, your lovely snake pixie um, earlier, but um, it looks like on your your Instagram and even in your little bio that we read earlier um, that you love wildlife. So yes. tell us about your love of wildlife and how you um, you teach people about wildlife. What what's all of that about? Well, I blame my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I 100% blame my dad because my dad was the guy who, when he was young, would go out on adventures with friends trying to find snakes and lizards and wild animals and bring them home. He was the one who was out there. He said he was walking home from elementary school one time and there was a rattlesnake on the side of the road. And he asked a kid to hold a stick and keep the rattlesnake there while he ran home to get his little um, snake catching stick. And I'm like, how old were you? And he's like, oh, I was like in fourth grade. And I'm oh like, my gosh, what? that's so <laughs> dangerous. He was, running, he was running home to get his stick. He came back. The snake was gone. The kid was gone. The stick was laying on the ground. <laughs> just, yeah. That kid was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that kid was very smart. <laughs> One of his favorite stories to tell me was uh, when he was a teenager, him and a buddy of his went riding on their bikes down to the Creek. 
And when they reached the creek, they both kind of laid back and they had their hands resting behind their head. And when my dad reached back, he felt a snake back there. Oh. He pulled it out and it was just a garter snake. He was like, oh, oh. okay. Cause he's caught garter snakes all the time. Yeah. So he set it aside. Well, then he saw two cotton mouths, <gasps> water oh. moccasins. Yes. Going for the water. And him and his buddy are like, oh, we haven't caught a cotton mouth before. We need to catch one. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> oh, no, so, so dangerous. So he was quickly trying to carve a stick to catch a snake, which back in those days, of course, you would carve a little um, V or a Y at the end of a stick to pin the head down. That's how they used to catch snakes when, when, you know, they were younger. And he, one of the snakes had gone off in the woods, so it was gone. The other one went in the river. And so him and his buddy are running into the river and he jabs the stick down and the snake goes whoop, 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 whoop up the stick. It's back end wrapping around the stick. And he's like, I don't know how far down because the creek was burning and he couldn't see. I don't know how far down its head is. I'm trying to reach down, I'm trying to reach down and see because he's trying to wrap the snake to throw it up on the shore so his buddy could catch it. Mm. Well, he reaches down, he pulls the stick up, expecting the snake to go flying onto the shore and it goes whoop, whoop, whoop up his arm. <sighs> and its head was <sighs> down at the very base of his hand right here. Gosh. And my dad was very fortunate and blessed that cotton mouths are not known for biting. They are known Ooh. for having a flea first instinct. They're not as aggressive as some other venomous species. They're still venomous. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so he's out there struggling in the water to get the snake off his arm and eventually goes plop and sails away. And he's like, Ooh, who, and he ran back to shore and his buddy's like, we probably shouldn't do that ever again. He's like, you're probably. Yeah. <laughs> so oh my gosh. He, what a story. <laughs> he learned from that. But when I was a kid, we would go to state parks and go hiking around the lake. And I hated hiking. My parents loved it. And the only way my dad could convince me to go hiking was if we were catching lizards and we had to be catching lizards or we had to be catching toads or something because otherwise I was like, uh, -uh it's boring. Why are we just walking? We need to do something. <laughs> I, I can't stand it. Same thing with books. If it's just boring, something needs to happen. So we would go and we would catch, uh, fence lizards, uh, five lane skinks, the blue tail lizards. Um, and we would fill up a little, uh, milk gallon jug that we had rinsed out and we would carry them in there until the end of the hike. And then we would let them all go. But that was our little fun thing that we would do. And I started getting me interested in reptiles. And whenever we were out in a big public location, if there was a snake, especially a non-venomous species now, my dad finally learned his lesson at this point. <laughs> if you saw a snake, like a black rat snake, corn snake, something simple, maybe if you saw a hognose snake, something that's not, you know, dangerously venomous, he would pick it up. And he would show it to whatever people were around. If there were kids there, if there were um, adults there, he would catch a snake and he would let the kids touch it. Because when you find a lot of snakes in the wild and they realize that you're not trying to hurt them, they'll actually relax in your hands. And that was something that he would do. He would do wildlife education whenever we were out in public. And the big inspiration for that was, of course, Steve Irwin, crocodile hunter. And that really, really, really inspired my dad when we would go out. And that also inspired me. So that's something I love doing too, is if I'm out in public and I see a snake and everyone's freaking out, I'm like, ah, that's a black rat snake. That's my friend. And I'll go over there and I'll pick it up. And people look at me like, I'm crazy. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you can touch him. He's fine. He's calmed down. Just make sure you touch down here. Don't startle him. Don't go around the head and scare him around the head because I think the, there's a quote from, um, what is it? Clint's reptiles. Um, one of my favorite YouTube channels. It's a, uh, when you are a noodle with a head, the world's a very scary place. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that also extends to other wildlife. Just, I've always loved animals ever since I was little. And my mom was like, you're going to own a zoo someday. And I was like, yeah, I am. <laughs> so we're currently working <laughs> that on that. Great. <laughs> yeah. Well, what other animals do you have? We have two dogs currently, a German shepherd named Tohi and a great Pyrenees named Phoebe. We have one cat. Her name is Reselda, but we call her Ray Ray. We currently have a collection of ducks. They're um, call duck and call duck runner crosses. And we keep them mainly for um, pest control because we have a huge slug problem in our garden. Huge. And I love them because they eat all the slugs. And they keep the garden pest free. So they're wonderful to have around. Um, and then of course we have the two snakes. We also just got a beehive this year. So that's been exciting. Oh, wow. Do you have a swarm that's come? Um, 
Well, we uh, we purchased a package of bees, okay. although we did end up with some drama because they decided to swarm within like the first month. And so the hive kind of split up. Well, we figured out it was because the queen we had gotten was not laying at a very nice, predictable brood pattern. So the hive just split over that. So that's been, it's been an adventure trying to learn bee drama. Yeah. Bee How drama. interesting. I didn't it's know that they could have drama like that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the queen had to be kicked out. She wasn't laying good. So then they swarmed wow. over it and split. Huh. Very interesting. Although well, it's exciting. My favorite feature about bees is um, they have, the, of course, the majority of the bee worker bees, of course, are the females. The work, all workers are female. Then you have the drones and their only purpose is to mate with other queens that are out in the area. But one, uh, one role that the worker bees will take up is what some people call an undertaker bee where they will literally take their dead, they'll cover them in a preservative, and then they'll carry them off to a burial site where they dispose of them. Wow. How so, interesting. Yeah. First of all, I didn't know that, I thought that all the worker bees were male, that like the queen was the only female. No, 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 no. They're all female. Wow. So interesting. Yep. Hmm. So. There's a lot you can learn from bees. So much, so much. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine us like owning like a zoo or a wildlife exhibit. I mean, we have enough trouble like taking care of, well, not, not trouble, but um, in the, in the current space where we live, uh, two dogs is enough. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, we don't have a lot of, a lot of land. So well, yeah. two dogs is, is enough. My, my sister though, she has a farm yes, and her husband, she does. they've got, oh, 20. 20 chickens, I think. Awesome. We're planning yeah. to get in chickens soon. So that's our next endeavor. They're fun. They are, they're very fun. You got to watch them though, because they'll lay their eggs anywhere. Oh, the ducks <laughs> do that too. It's just I was, yeah, that's it probably true. Birds. <laughs> yep. Yep. They're funny. But yeah, they've got all the chickens and two dogs. And I think they're looking to do, is it, I think it's an agricultural grant or something like that so mm -hmm. that they can use the money then to actually purchase like, um, I don't know if they want to do ducks. I think they want to do like miniature Highland cattle, Aww, those which are so would cute. be so fun. I know. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, animals love animals. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, with that, we're gonna go ahead and get into our topic today. And mm -hmm. so, Lydia, you chose this one. So, what is the movie that we'll be talking about today? Princess Mononoke. All right. Oh, right. and you actually robbed the copy of the DVD. Nice. Yes. Because <laughs> we don't have any streaming services at our house. We literally have to do everything DVD. Because out where we live, internet reception, no. Mm. That's why I'm currently at the church recording. So. <laughs> yes. So. so when we were talking about this, we had a couple of ideas of what we would talk about. Mm -hmm. And we uh, for any for any of you who have listened for a good period of time you know that we're slowly making our way through talking about all the different studio ghibli movies <laughs> and that is my goal to do each and every one of them um not That's not straight point. they'll be spread out but <laughs> yeah throughout the lifetime of the podcast right <laughs> so lydia why is princess mononoke your favorite I guess it's because every time I watch it, I get something new out of it. It's one of those multi-layer films where there are so many different elements to it. Every single time you watch it, there's something new you can gain from it. And I also like that it's written in a way where it almost feels like an old legend or mythology. And I did love studying legends and mythology growing up. So I, I and Every single time I dive in, I'm like, oh, I didn't notice that. Or, oh, I didn't pick up on that the first time around. And that's something that I just love about anime in particular is a lot of anime and Japanese inspired um, shows, movies, et cetera. They like to go for more abstract concepts and they like to give more room for you to think about it. They don't usually tell you what to think. They leave room for interpretation, for you to dive in deep, for you to explore. And that's definitely something about Princess Mononoke is it is a very, very deep, rich and complex story where you can always pull something new from it. Yeah, that's so true. I, I agree with you on 
what you just said about, you know, Japanese anime and inspired films. And it's, it is so deep and so layered. And um, I, I liked what you said about it. It leaves room for interpretation because I think that's really true. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Princess Mononoke, like you said, mm -hmm. is, is very deep. So yeah, I liked that a lot. Yeah. And we, we've now seen it twice. So we saw uh, the first time like several years ago and then, we actually just uh, so with refresh watched it um, last night, and as you said, Lydia, I took away something different this time that I watched it, and I think I appreciated it even more watching it the second time. Mm -hmm. And going on with, you know, anime as far as like it deals with abstract con um, concepts and has deeper meanings, that is a big distinction I think from storytelling here in the West, mm -hmm. as opposed to like, um, you know, Eastern Asian uh, storytelling is that it doesn't fit like the mold of what we would read like by um, a James Patterson book um, mm -hmm. or something like that. It, it lets the reader draw its own conclusions, I would think. Mm -hmm. Or viewer in this case, but yes. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. And one aspect of Eastern storytelling I like is oftentimes there's no one villain. There's no single antagonist. In fact, oftentimes the antagonists are the things within yourself that you battle against. It's often, it's more often about your internal conflicts and the internal conflicts of those around you more so than a great overarching external enemy. Because when I think about Western storytelling, I think about the classic hero's journey, overcoming some great obstacle. I think about like Marvel and DC where you're actively fighting an enemy and you might have some internal conflict that normally takes the backseat in comparison to the, you know, major external conflict. Um, and usually there is a single big bad or a single singular evil force instead of everyone has the capacity for good and evil within them, which I see that more often in Eastern storytelling, the conflict of good and evil within the individual compared to the conflict of good and evil on the um, external side. Yeah, and that's one of, the, one of the points I wanted to get to since you brought up, we'll go ahead and talk about it a little bit, uh, kind of that's found on it. In Princess Mononoke, as Lydia has explained, there is no one antagonist. Mm. There is not this like overarching villain. There is not this overarching uh, hero or whatever it might be. It is the three classics of man versus nature, mm -hmm. man versus self, man versus man. And when you watch the film, when it first starts off, it's like, okay, the demons, the demons and the animals, they are the antagonists. Then you get a little bit later on, it's like, okay, no, these other villagers attacking this other community, they are the antagonists. It's like, no, this woman, she's the antagonist. And you, you, you oh. all win. You're, you're all part of the same group. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And I will say for uh, an I guess you could say a pseudo antagonist, kind of an antagonist. Lady Aboshi is so well written. Yeah. Like I love her because she is both devious and compassionate. Mm -hmm. She's like two sides of a coin in one. And it's like, you want to despise her, but you want to love her. And it's like, you're torn between the two. And I'm like, oh, oh, it is. She's so, so well written. And just her whole character arc from beginning to end you can see where she's coming from. She's coming from a place where she's been competing with, I guess, what would be considered the feudal era. She's been competing against all these lords, the emperor, all these very power hungry groups that we do see actively terrorizing the village at one point. And she's trying to set up a society that can be safe from that, that can live on its own, separated from that kind of tyranny, so to speak. But in the ass, but in her pursuits of separating herself from that tyranny, she has terrorized the forest. And in exchange, the forest has struck back at her. And that kind of pulls into a very strong spiritual theme that I see, which is 
the big antagonist of the film is what I would consider to be the sin, or I guess as they would say, the Akamar, the demon of malice and hate, because hatred is what actively causes all the conflict, even with an Ashitaka, because at the beginning of the story, he gets the curse, yep. the curse mark. And the curse mark is actively tied to him showing acts of malice, violence, and murder. That's the only time it will spread. And when he shows compassion and love to those who are his enemies, the smart will stop. And there is like a moment where it seems like it is withheld and he has time, more time. But every time that he does show violence and his, and the violence that is shown when he attacks is pretty brutal. <laughs> yes. I mean, it is pretty brutal. <laughs> Heads fly off, arms are cut off. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the most like violent, I would say out of all the Studio Jubilee films. Oh, yes. And oh, one yeah. of the longest, it was like two hours and 14 oh, yeah. minutes. Oh, yeah. Now, before we get too far into this, again, this is a Studio Ghibli film, came mm -hmm. out in 1997. Yes. Um, we have our main character, I would say, Ashitaka, mm -hmm. and Lee explained in the beginning he gets, this, he gets this curse, and it's all about his journey through these different uh, communities and villages, um, trying to figure out, you know, what, what this fullness of this, this curse. Correct, mm -hmm. yes. And... He says something in, uh, I think towards the end of the movie or like in the middle of the movie where, you know, this curse, like it's this hatred that fuels and boils and festers mm -hmm. and it's going to kill me. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's a great representation of like, we have like hatred in our hearts, like that, that kills us like spiritually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was a great, you know, spiritually speaking, that was a great representation of that. Oh, yeah. And the scene where he is trying to prevent San, who is called Princess Mononoke by the humans, and Lady Eboshi from killing each other, that is when he gets to show the full manifestation of what hatred, malice, violence looks like. And I think that is so beautiful because he says, there is a demon inside you. It is inside me, too. And that is... I think the all-encompassing theme of the film is the danger of allowing violence, hatred, and revenge to continue a never-ending cycle of violence, hatred, and revenge. And he's trying to save everyone, if he can, from this curse, from this prison of vengeance and violence, because he is, he is an external, ex, he's an external example of what happens when hatred eats you up. And he will have a much more active, you know, uh, I guess more intense ending than somebody else who lives in a state of hatred, but a constant hatred. But there were some scriptures that came to mind when I was thinking over this. And one of them was Genesis 9, 6, which was after the great flood had wiped out the wickedness from the earth. And God states, whoever sheds the blood of men by man shall his blood be shed. For God has made man in his own image. And that I think is a huge theme there is he's trying to stop bloodshed because of the nature of how God did create creation and we are meant to take care of it. But even greater still is God made man in his own image. And if you will shed blood by my man, blood, you know, by a by man shall his blood be shed. It's the nature of violence and of vengeance and of that never ending cycle. And I also like Ashitaka because he sh displays a level of, I guess, complexity, even though he is a straightforward good guy protagonist, because he does still take action where he acts in violence, where he murders someone trying to preserve his own life. And there are consequences with Mark spreading. But by the end of the story, this uh, scripture came to mind from Romans 12, 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil, but do give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. That is definitely something that he does throughout the film. And this is my favorite part of it. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Because with Ashitaka, his goal was to live peaceably with all he could, with the forest, with the people in the village. Um, and then feeding off of the theme of vengeance, beloved, never avenge yourselves, believe it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. And in some ways, we do see that repayment at the end of the film. 
And then to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I don't know if you've ever heard this interpretation of that burning coals verse. Um, some people talk about it like, oh yeah, you're burning their head by showing them kindness, you know, kill them with kindness. I actually heard a sermon once that explained that that verse with the heaping burning coals is sometimes when a person's fire would go out, they would go to their neighbor's house and they would bring with them some type of bucket or basket or container and they would get hot coals from the furnace of that neighbor to take back home and to sustain their, you know, to cook, to keep their house warm, but they would need to borrow coals from someone else. And so when you are overcoming evil with good, you are giving people the coals, the light, the fuel they need to learn what kindness is, what goodness is, and how to walk in the light of the Lord. And that's what Ashitaka does by the end of the film. And his examples of compassion and kindness, he gives the people and the wildlife around him, the tools they need to overcome that evil with good, that coal they need to sustain themselves. That is wonderful. I love that um, because it is what we're doing. We are to, well, and even Jesus says, they will know you by your love. Your yes. love is what will show the world who you belong to. And um, I love all of those verses that you pointed out. That was what something that I was thinking about too, mm -hmm. was, you know, yeah, don't repay evil for evil, for vengeance is the Lord's. Mm -hmm. it, God is the judge. He is yes. the only one who can repay justice. Um, that does that right does not belong to us. It is to him alone. And actually yes. to Jesus specifically, um, God has given that right to to judge the world. Yes. And um yeah, it is. It's it's such a beautiful representation. Um, I can definitely see the the forest spirit too is almost like a a godlike character. I mean, he mm -hmm. in the story he is a god, but mm -hmm. like he almost to me represents pretty closely um, at least the aspects of like the forest spirit takes life and gives life, and it's his to take and to give. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, that's. I mean, that's what God is. It it is His to take and to give, and we are to show glory to Him no matter no matter what. And um, and yeah, He He will ultimately be the one to to um, to to bring justice. Which yeah, we do see in the end where um, I don't know whatever that goo stuff is that's going over the whole land and body, killing. The, yeah, pretty much the body of the uh, the spirit. Yeah, the ex exactly. Yeah, it kills everything because it's like you guys. It's almost like you don't deserve to live in a way. And but then when he does get the head back and he truly dies, the forest spirit, new life is grown again, and. I don't know, that just shows that from, from death, from the death of something can come new life. And just because it seemed really bad and dead, you can still have newness that comes in. And you can pull a Christ allegory into that as well. Yeah. With the nature of the death, the consequence of it, and the life that comes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And one of the other things, again, all wonderful, great points and scriptural references. Uh, there is a scene where uh, Akitashi is going to the village uh, where Lady Kadoshi uh, resides, and we have these people who are bandaged up and they're light lepers. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca, you pointed out that that was Jesus's uh, parable of you know healing the the, uh, the lepers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and showing them kindness and. Um, and love, even when, you know, the moment when Jesus, um, he actually reaches out and touches them. And that's what they, that's what they needed so much was that human connection and, um, and the healing that happens and how wonderful that is. And even actually, um, when they're in the water, you see at least one of the, the people who had leprosy, um, they're in the water and after at the very end when there's new life coming and the forest spirit has has officially died they are completely healed and they're they no longer 
um, have leprosy. I was like, wow, what a what an amazing visual representation of um, of that miracle and of that compassion too. Yeah, I mean that is why, as far as characters go, Lady Aboshi is very very beautiful to me because she took compassion on the lepers. I guess due to something in her own life that taught her compassion and brought them to her secret garden. And there's also such an interesting contrast because the lepers who are pitiful are the ones who make her weapons. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who make the guns that she will use to defend her town. And so she's made sure that even they have a purpose and a role within the town. That's something that I really did like about the story is everybody in the town had a role, including the prostitutes that she brought, bought the, you know, brothel contracts for. And yes, the, 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 the prostitute characters were great. Like <laughs> they Toki, were, Oh, Toki was the best. Toki is my favorite. Hands down. <laughs> yeah. So something lovable, lovable characters in this movie mm -hmm. and getting into kind of another scriptural reference in Genesis mm -hmm. where this movie seems to kind of touch on or greatly emphasize like environmentalism or taking care of the land, which is what God commands us to do mm -hmm. in Genesis. Um, again, paraphrasing, but God command us to, you know, take ownership, take command of the land, mm -hmm. you know, and that means, you know, making sure the vegetation, the grass, the inhabitants, uh, the sea life, wildlife, that all of that is governed and that we have a responsibility to make sure that is going on. But as we can see in our society today, we don't do a great job of that. There's some awesome organizations who are doing really good work with that. Um, but yeah, it is important, you know. Oh yeah. And I do find it interesting with how it was framed using the concept of, I believe, if I'm remembering right, the concept of the the kami, the concept of within, I guess it's within Shintoism, where they have these concepts of certain spirits govern certain things instead of God being the single governance, which is why they use the great beasts as a symbol of that. And that is definitely a difference that would be closer towards something that would be considered pagan from a Christian belief system. Right. But there is still a beauty in it because it does tie back to what you said about how God gave us the command to govern and take care of things. And that's why the ending of the film, I think, is beautiful. Uh, spoilers, where there is this line of, we're going to rebuild the town. We're going to rebuild a better town. Yeah. So I think that is great because it's like, it's not that they need to stop construction or stop trying to keep themselves safe because the external threats do not disappear. Just because um, Lord Asano and his men were wiped out does not mean that they're not going to have another threat in the future. But at the same time, they need to be more conscientious. They need to take more care when they rebuild this time so that they're not just wiping out everything because there is an essential element to nature that they must survive off of and without it, they suffer. Yes, that's, I'm so glad that you brought that up of like, it's not a, we can't use anything from nature. We must completely abstain from all of that. It's like, no, okay, let's live in more harmony mm -hmm. with nature. Like, don't be stupid and, you know, <laughs> and, and overuse the land or, or whatever it is, but like use the stuff that's there. It's mm -hmm. God put it on this earth for us to use and to, and to to live with it's okay to cut down trees to build houses like that's just kind of part of it we will plant new trees and mm -hmm. um yeah so i don't think we have to be scared of that um just like they were in in the movie um mm -hmm. yeah they did they, they, they took it a little little overboard trying to annihilate all nature and um that's not good <laughs> that's that's the unhealthy way to do that yes. but yeah rebuilding in a healthy way like you were saying um yes. is good Definitely. Yeah. And it, it's getting to that point where, okay, industrialization is a good thing because we're growing and we're taking all these materials and making new things. But as both of you have said, it gets on dangerous territory where like, we're just wiping out to wiping out no trees. You know, they, uh, it's, um, 
oh, it's a psalm. They a they tore down a forest to put in a parking lot or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they yes. uh, put all the trees and put them in a tree museum. People pay a dollar and a half just to see them. <laughs> um, well, but yeah, I also, I'm sorry. Oh no, go go ahead. I also like it because. San and Lady Eboshi are supposed to represent two different extreme viewpoints. Mm. One is extreme industrialization with Lady Eboshi, of course. And with San, that is extreme environmentalism where there is no peace, there is no quarter, there is no compromise. You must absolutely completely commit to the environment. All humans are evil. And I like that because neither one of them is represented as being completely correct. Like the um, extreme environmentalist stance of all humans are evil, humans destroy everything was wrong because they could live in peace and harmony as was represented from Ashitaka's village. Ashitaka's village was one that had been able to live at peace with its nature, with its world, even though it had been cast out from the emperor. And Lady Eboshi's extreme viewpoint on industrialism had resulted in a lot of suffering, a lot of pain and would probably have ultimately ended with the people getting sick probably from the extreme exposure to different things and to you know the extreme amount of uh, iron that they were mining out of the hillside and they both were the, it's a story of avoiding extremes and finding balance and that's something I really really like yeah love that and getting on to um, a couple um, other points that we have written down here. Um, again, we've we've covered a lot in like the only like gosh, it hasn't even been like thirty minutes, and I feel <laughs> that we've like taught like so much uh, regarding like the content. Yeah, but it's so rich. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and you could pull so much just from this one movie, and if we did, we'd be here all day. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I I love that about Studio Jubilee films where you can get something new from almost any of them, no matter how many times you watch it, because it's it's that complex, it's that amount of storytelling that uh, that I really enjoy. Um, let let's talk about the forest there for a minute. Um, oh. You you weren't you weren't too much of a fan. Um, the visuals. I was creeped out too. I was creeped oh out too God. the first time. <laughs> it creeped so me out too. freaky. <laughs> but when it's a night walker, it's really pretty. It is really pretty. Yeah, Just you not, know, not, <laughs> not during the forest spirit. Time. No, you're like, oh, it's a nice deer with like multiple horns, and then it turns its face on you. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, it, it kind of it kind of reminds me of like you know when we think of angels. Versus oh, yes, the yes. biblical right. the biblical, <laughs> biblical detention, <laughs> yeah. And mm. when you when he's like, "Oh, what do you think we would look like?" He's like, "Well, not like that." <laughs> yeah, not like that. I don't know. Ooh. I wanted him to be more appealing and more more soothing. Yes. But yeah. oh yeah, continue. Oh, I was just gonna say his. It's the human face that that throws human, yes. but not human. It's very yeah. strange. It's yes. yeah. Man. And the colors, like that kind of reddish brown color for the face, yeah. it's just like, it looks like a mask. It looks like, you know, some of those yeah. like classic masks that you would see in Japanese culture. And I'm like, oh my. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but something I love about the Nightwalker in particular, and I don't know if you drew this connection too, but I'm assuming you're last Airbender fans. Yes. Yes. I was going to mention yes, that. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 The North Pole, the fusion mm -hmm. with the spirit of the ocean. Yeah. 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 Clearly Nightwalker inspired. Yes. That's yes. what I was thinking. I was like, <laughs> okay, definitely a connection there. I think I even said that while, while we were watching it uh, last night, I was like, you know, I bet they took inspiration from this movie. Yep. I have to say they did. Cause that's like, you have to look at the Nightwalker and look at Avatar Aang being fused with the ocean. And you're like, they looked they look so similar. <laughs> Very similar. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder too, even if um, they drew that visual of a creature from Eastern like manuscripts or like old, old images of things. Um, I haven't seen any and I haven't done any research, but possibly because it just, it looks like something that would be, I don't know, in old art uh, from, from the time. 
Well, I know that this was a labor of love for Miyazaki. I can't remember exactly how many years he spent on it, but he animated the majority of it himself. Wow, was, really? Mm -hmm. So I have to double check my facts on that too. But I remember a lot of people have analyzed this in depth. This was a labor of love. I think he started this, if I remember right, in the 80s and he worked on it like frame by frame. And this, some people call it like his Cinderella. Some people call it his like magnum opus because this was a film he poured a ton of himself into. Hi, are you gonna chill in the chair? You wanna come over here? Sorry, Pixie was sneaking off. <laughs> but yes, um, like one of our favorite scenes is the water scene when they're at the, uh, say, you know, the sacred site and they're going through the sort of like lake area and the way it's animated and how fluid it is, it's like, I can't believe that this was animated in like the 90s. It's gorgeous. Like, it's, in my opinion, it's one of the prettier uh, Miyazaki films just in general. I mean, Miyazaki films are gorgeous, but there's something about this that has like a, like an otherworldly nature to it. Just mm. hands down. Yeah, it's like, it, it has that sort of fantasy, fantastical feeling and yet mm -hmm. so familiar as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, that's the best kind of fantasy yes. when it feels familiar and yet there's an otherworldliness to it. Yes. Um, Cause you, you, you immerse yourself even more into the story when, when you have that. Um, yeah. You talking about the, um, the, the sacred pool, sacred lake, or whatever yes. um, reminds me of the tree spirits, those tree spirits. What are the, the, the Kadama? Is that what they're Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Look, they look like little bobbleheads. Yes. Yeah. My yeah. favorite. I love them. Oh, when I first saw yeah. them, I was like, <laughs> I did not like them. Even, even at like, the end of the movie, what they do, it's like you had to get that one more time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just one more. Gosh. They're absolutely adorable. I'm like, they're so cute. I mean, and they're definitely inspired from the concept of yokai, which I'm certain you're familiar with. So clearly this was supposed to be kind of like a yokai that explains like the nat the sounds that you hear walking through the forest. Sometimes you hear clicking sounds in the forest. It's probably what it's supposed to be. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, yeah. Uh, we well, found out I like uh, yokai and like, uh, uh, I think another term is like Ishigami. Um, mm -hmm. if, and those who has ever seen uh, Death Note. Um, yes. We okay. think of like, you know, Shigami demon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I think of love is war. Oh, Kagiyama. Kagami, right? Oh. That's his name. Oh no, no, yeah, yeah. She, she, yeah. Sorry, Kagami, <laughs> the gods of death. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. So we've been watching a lot of the Kagiyama love is horror lately. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, my um, husband and I have been going on um, Demon Slayer recently. So, oh, <laughs> oh nice. Demon Slayer. Where are you in Demon Slayer? We just finished the first season in Mugen Train. So, okay, nice. we're getting excited because our friend is getting us hyped for the second season. But he's also trying to get us to watch um, Made in Abyss, and we're kind Ooh. of tempted by Made in Abyss right now because we're like, ah, cutesy story with dark undertones. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, Made in Abyss is really, really good. Season two, love Demon Slayer. I think that's like my all-time favorite anime. Um, but season two, warning, is a bit slow in the okay. beginning, but it picks up. I'm okay up. with that. I like the characters. Yeah. I honestly don't mind spending time with them. If, if you <laughs> get to spend more time with the characters, I'm cool with it. Yep. Um, <laughs> nice. Oh, well, what I was getting to is that in Japanese culture, they think of like, you know, demons and, um, mm -hmm. sorry, our dog is whacking their ferocious tail against the it's it's chair. Uh, <laughs> um, but in Japanese, in Japanese culture, they don't view like demons or spirits as we do in the West. I it's uh, very, different um very different context for them or mm -hmm. we're like oh you know demon is fear and so obviously bad but mm -hmm. in, and in, and our connection with demons is more t closely tied to angels than to right something kind of connected within the natural world because, exactly so that's where you have the concepts like the kami the you know the gods who are masters of certain things and the yokai and shinigami of course the masters of death except etc cetera, etc cetera, so mm -hmm. yeah whereas in most Western, particularly in religion, it's like, you know, we only trust, you know, one spirit, the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and we don't have like 
spirit. So we go to to pray out for different things. Whereas in Asian religions, there is a um, god of fertility, god of you know mm -hmm. such and such. Yeah. So I think it's very uh, very interesting to kind of have those uh, two different understandings. Well, mm -hmm. it's very. I mean, we're monotheistic, and they're polytheistic. So mm -hmm. um, that's a different. There's a. I mean, polytheism is all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then there are different cultures and different interpretations of it. But again, that kind of ties back to, I think, what Princess Mononoke was supposed to be. It's supposed to be a very rich uh, Nihonjin, just Japanese cultural film that just digs deep into their history, their culture. And everything in it, to my knowledge, is pretty much something that Miyazaki made up on his own. It's his whole original um, story, but he drew inspiration from things that were within his culture. And that's another reason why I love the film. I'm like, if you want to see a film that gives you kind of an idea of what, like let their legends, their mythology, their culture, and like going into like Shintoism and all that stuff to like kind of explore and expand into it, this is a good film to like kind of get a taste of what that is like and a taste of what feudal Japan was most likely like. So it's not historically accurate, of course, but if you're talking about something that's like a fairy tale or, you know, a fictional story that has that inspiration, this is a great film for exploring into that. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I, well, we have the one more second that we're going to get to here, um, apart from Princess Mononoke. But before we wrap up again, a lot of great points, a lot of great discussion. Uh, Lydia, was there anything else that you want to make sure that we touched upon concerning this film? Um, I could probably just talk about it for hours, so I can't really <laughs> say any, like one single point. It's like if if I had the power, I would just keep talking. So <laughs> okay, I think one of my favorite characters was. Um, not for their complexity, just because they were fun to have around, was Yaku. Ooh, Yaku. He was great. He was adorable. He, he was. He's so cute. He actually so looked faithful. cute, you know? So mm -hmm. faithful. Yes. I love that. <laughs> he needs that. something cute. I gotcha. Yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> I love that when um, San took off his um, bridle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. She took off the bridle and she was like, you can go anywhere you want now. You're free. And he was like, no, nah, I'm going to no. stay here. I like you my know? man actually talk. I'm not leaving him. Yeah, like he's my, my friend. He's my bro. I'm not leaving. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. That was really sweet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, and of course, another thing that's kind of fun to think about is, I, I kind of mentioned this offhandedly, but I think I know the name of Moro's two pups. I don't know if you kind of came to that conclusion too. Did, did you figure out what the names of the pups were most likely? Pups? No. All right, so San's name is San. Mm -hmm. What's San in Japanese? I don't know. Three? Yeah, the number three. Oh. So her first two pups are most likely Ichi and Ni. Oh. She literally named her kids okay. one, two, and three. Oh, my goodness. That's funny. <laughs> nice. Well, that's, that's that would make sense, bad. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's get into kind of like our recommendations. Um, Again, we can pick a ton of themes from this, but let's um, go around and pick one thing that we really liked and one thing that we probably didn't care for in this movie. Um, I'll go first. Um, so with the with this movie, I really loved the set design and mm -hmm. I loved the shift that happens where there's all this hatred and turmoil and all this like darkness, but then we see that shift of the newness and everything gets brighter, brighter and more colorful. Kind of gave me um, uh, fern golly vibes at the end <laughs> um, with In all the rapid vegetation and everything. And that's Miyazaki's um, style. He just yes. he has to throw in something connected to the environment. He loves it. That's what yes. he does. Mm -hmm. One thing I didn't particularly care for um, again, just a couple of things that, you know, freak me out. <laughs> I think, <laughs> um, what I mentioned a little bit earlier was, um, the little tree spirits. 
which are like my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's different. I know, I know. I just like right. the scene with them like backpacking each other where they were trying oh, to. I, okay, yeah. I, that was cute. <laughs> I did <laughs> like that. When they were all together, like moving in a direction, it was okay. When mm -hmm. it was like one or two that were just doing their little ee -e -e thing. They were staring that, into your soul. <laughs> yeah, that was not, not so great. <laughs> all right, uh, Lydia, go ahead. Oh man, I would probably say my favorite part about it overall is just the characters. Like, I don't think there's a character I don't like, like, and which is kind of rare for me to watch a film and I actually like all the characters, even like Jigo, who is technically probably the closest to a villain that we have. And like, you know, it just, there wasn't a character I did not like. They all were complex. They were all were fleshed out. They all were developed. Um, and they all fit within the story. They all had a purpose to play and they all were interconnected. I, I, I just love the way everything, everyone's story arcs, everyone's character arcs, they were all interconnected. And by the end, there really was a satisfying conclusion to it all. Probably the thing I ca don't care for about in the film overall though, is like the um, polytheism religious tones to it. I mean, that's something that I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to avoid going into this film with the first time I watched it. But it's something where if you're watching it within the realm of this isn't something that is necessarily inspired or like faithful to scripture, it's inspired by culture, it's a little bit easier to digest and appreciate. And I would probably say on my first watch through the thing that I liked the least was the, um, the violence. It took me a bit to get used to that part. So. Yeah, it is. Very it it does take you by surprise, honestly, because you just see this arrow. Oh, arms come off. Arms come oh, off. Yeah, it comes off. Yep. That's the first that. time you're like, whoa. <laughs> I was not prepared for that. Yeah, you're like, okay, well, at least we're setting up. This is how the rest of the movie is going to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, so one thing that I really liked, uh, really similar to you, Lydia, I really enjoyed the characters. Mm -hmm. The I really liked the depth of the characters that they weren't necessarily good or bad mm -hmm. that they were so complex um and that they could change their mind and even ashitaka he at one point he was accused by both sides like well whose side are you on you're you're on the other side you're on <laughs> yeah you know and it was like i mean that's he's in the middle and mm -hmm. but it yeah i liked that you know, Lady Iboshi was so complex and like, you, yeah, you you want to hate her, but you also really like her. And yes. you're like, ah, I'm so conflicted. <laughs> so um, conflicted, yes. <laughs> but, but that's life. That's, those, that's human. Mm -hmm. Rarely do we find someone in, who is holy and completely evil or yes. holy and completely good. Mm -hmm. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't exist. We are complex. Yes. And um, I really appreciated that about the film. And one thing I didn't like, which I'm surprised nobody said this yet, I really didn't like the forest spirit, the look. <laughs> well, that was the a face. given earlier. I just, wow. <laughs> I, I, I grew into it. It took a few watches, but I grew into it. <laughs> well, you come to expect it. You're like, okay, yes. yep, that's just, that's the forest that's the spirit. He looks. <laughs> it's just, yeah, he is who he is. He can't change that. <laughs> Won't stop, can't stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, it is the first Friday of the month that this episode will be coming out. So Ooh. it is time for one of my favorite segments. For those of you listening, we, you know that we do this. The first Friday is kind of like our own like tradition, I guess you would say. <laughs> so it is time for What Are We Watching? This is what we're watching this week. And as I said before, it is everybody's favorite segment. What are we watching? Again, not only what are we watching, what are we listening to? What are we reading? What are we playing for those of us who are gamers? It is the first Friday of the month. And we're just going to talk about, hash out what we've been, what, what's making us happy this week, basically. And so, Lydia, what are you watching, reading? play and listen to that you are enjoying um i mean 
we're getting ready to rewatch Gravity Falls here soon, probably Ooh. this upcoming week. So we like watching it every summer. It's just, it's, it's so much fun to watch. It is a very, it is very summer. Well, yeah, it is very. Well, it takes place yeah, during the summer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's the great. The whole theme is summer. So <laughs> yeah, we're getting ready to rewatch uh, Gravity Falls and I'm probably going to get ready to rewatch either a silent voice or in this corner of the world here soon. So Mm. Get, I want some feels. I need to cry soon. I need a good cry. <laughs> <laughs> you can just tell sometimes. <laughs> You're like, I got to get it out. I just mm-hmm. need it. I need the catharsis. So. <laughs> yep. And Rebecca, we've been watching, um, again, on Crunchyroll, different things. Um, gosh. Well, we then kicked it out with a couple of cuckoos. Oh, yeah. And um, Aha then. Um, then they can do that. You know, the size oh, of life. yeah, where she's the short little girl, yeah, the tall short guy. tall guy, yeah, uh, and then he's so uh, Rido. He, he's very extra. <laughs> he's so ridiculous. <laughs> and if you had it your way, we'd probably be watching, uh, rewatching all of Demon Slayer. I mean, I I could always rewatch <laughs> Demon Slayer. You know, it's so good. Now I heard you hadn't seen Full Metal Alchemist yet. No, That's correct. we haven't. We have not. So. I get, know, classic apparently. And yeah, so give <laughs> us a couple of reasons why we should see Full Metal Alchemist. First things first, if you like Demon Slayer, you will like Full Metal Alchemist. Okay. Hands down. That's the number one reason right there. But I typically recommend if you want to go into it, you can I would recommend watching the first series that Bones did. Because when Bones did the first Full Metal Alchemist series, they were creating it before the manga was finished. So it has a completely different ending. Um, the film that ends it actually is within the canon. So it kind of has that same tie in like Mugen Train does with Demon Slayer. Then after you watch the series, go read the manga. Go through the manga from beginning to end. And then after that, go into Brotherhood. That's the order I typically recommend because the complexities within the story, the story of course is about the two main brothers, Edward and Alphonse, who in attempting a taboo to try to resurrect their dead mother, end up his brother loses his body and Edward loses an arm and a leg in the process of trying to bring his brother's soul back. And so they're on a journey to try to restore their bodies and to try to find a way to undo what has happened to their bodies in the process of them committing the taboo of trying to resurrect their mother. And in this process, Edward becomes a state alchemist. They get involved in a big government conspiracy. There is a lot of mystery and intrigue as they're trying to figure out what the greater evil is that is at force within this world. Um, And if there is one reason above all else, Hiromo Arakawa can write female characters like no one else. If you like Studio uh, Ghibli, like female characters, Full Metal Alchemist female characters are like top tier. Like they are complex, they are interesting, they are fierce, they know how to fight. I, I absolutely, absolutely love the thing, the female characters that she writes. That's awesome. Or well, like I guess there's no way out of it now. No, nope, got to watch it. You have to watch it. It's good. <laughs> And if I can get tickets, um, there is the Fruit Basket Prelude that is now out in theaters. That. Is it out? It's out now. Yeah. So, oh man, honestly, yeah, I definitely want to see that. Yes. You know, we can yes, we yeah. can pick a night um, that we're not busy next week and go see it. The thing is, we would have to make the trek because it's all new plane in Cool in, Springs. No. Oh. Further. Oh. Offering those. Ooh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really far. Oh. Yeah. Worth it though. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I'm gonna wait for the DVD and buy it then. <laughs> yes, which will probably be out soon um, because it, it, at least to me, it seems that when dubbed and subbed Japanese films are coming out in theaters, since I were getting them on Blu ray and DVD a lot quicker, mm-hmm. I know that we saw Bell, it was back in mm. mm-hmm. January and it came out and now it's available. Um, now uh, uh may may it became available yep yeah that one was good have you seen bell no but i've seen clips of it and it looks beautiful it is great it's yes beautiful. gorgeous yeah gorgeous. the art is amazing and the the voices are amazing because it's surrounding this girl who can sing but she's like scared to to show her own voice but she can do it in this virtual reality and mm-hmm. oh man yeah it's so good 
Just what I really enjoyed about <laughs> it is they had the original uh, Japanese um, voice actors who sang, but they also got a English voice actor who could also sing the English um, mm -hmm. translated uh, version of that song. So that was great. I really enjoyed that too. Oh yeah, it was fantastic. And for those of you who are gamers, um, like myself, um, there are a lot of the great games coming out. One thing that I'll just touch on briefly is that the new uh, PlayStation 5, or sorry, PlayStation Plus subscriptions are out there now tiered as um, essential, extra, and premium. I got premium for 12 months, 100 bucks, which to me is a great deal because any of you who play games on different consoles, you know that games can be anywhere from 50 to 70, $70 a piece uh, regarding their popularity and their newness in the community. So and expensive. I was like, I could either spend, you know, $100 on two games, or I could get a whole library of the games. May not like all of them, but to me, that is a great value. Uh, oh. Currently, I'm playing Spider Man Miles Morales that came out when the PS5 premiered, and um, it gave me uh, PlayStation 2 vibes when I had that way back in middle high school playing the original Amazing Spider Man. Mm -hmm. So really enjoying that. Probably gaming more than I need to, but it's a it is a good extracurricular. Yeah. Our our big goal for gaming in the future is we are getting hyped about Scarlet and Violet right now. Pokemon Scarlet Violet. Have you not no. heard about it? Uh, no, no. Tell us know. tell us about that. There's a whole new like they're doing a whole new region. I, it's, I think it's supposed to be kind of Italy and Spanish inspired. And I absolutely love the new starters. My favorite is the grass starter, Sprigatito, who is a little grass kitten. I'm just still waiting to see when they're going to review, reveal what it uh, later evolves into because I'm like, please, I, I kind of wanted to keep all four paws on the ground this time. I'm tired of bipedal on uh, starters, <laughs> I'm sorry. But my husband and I are big Pokemon nerds, so that's something that we're actually getting really hyped about. So. Oh, nice, nice. Man, I haven't played a Pokemon game in, gosh, I, I think since I had the Game Boy Color oh, and uh, the, the original, so the Ruby and the Sapphire and the Yellow Edition. Um, well, Ruby and, Ruby and Sapphire were Game Boy Advance, so that's still Oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. Nice. <laughs> and then I tried to get into Pokemon Go, you know, several years ago when that came out, and I got into it for a little bit, then I was like, eh, you know. Well, we're, we, me and my husband, we have so much fun with it. And we're, we're Pokemon nerds. We, <laughs> nice. we, we love it. We love our Pokemon games. <laughs> now, Rebecca, you weren't like big into Pokemon when like it came out, and <laughs> I think I made you watch like the new, well, not new movie. It was on Netflix called, you know, Pikachu, I Choose You, or Pokemon, I Choose You. Mm -hmm. Um, something like that, which is kind of like a good. retelling of the first season of the original Pokemon, um, uh, Indigo, um, Lee, Indigo I think Lee. it was, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it was good. I yeah. liked it. <laughs> I still need to see it. I mean, we kind of stopped watching the Pokemon films and series after a certain point, just because it just wasn't easy for us to watch. And we had other stuff we wanted to watch, so, but... Yeah, absolutely. Well, getting on from that, again, we have enjoyed um, talking with uh, Lydia Jane as our guest today on this episode. Lydia, if people want to follow you or maybe um, contract you to do some editing for them, where can people follow you? Um, I'm on I'm on Instagram. My uh, handle is Lydia Jane Writes. Um, and that's pretty much where I am. I don't want to have too many social media. I've learned that when you try to spread yourself out there, you kind of spread yourself a little bit thin. So yeah, I'm pretty much on Instagram. I do have a website. I'm currently closed for uh, editing submissions right now, just because I had a big uh, influx of people who sent in requests, but I'm hoping to open myself back up to uh, editing requests the next year. We'll see. I tend to have a lot of people who are like, Hey, can you, can you inch me in I, for next year? Are you, are you ready to schedule me? Can I have the spot? So I get booked pretty fast. That's awesome. Wonderful. Well, until next time, keep those Haley shut. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> and until next time, uh,
Okay, this is where I don't know why I always mess up at the endings. Okay. <laughs> Then this is the unedited version of what you don't hear in the final version. Yep. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. And until next time, everyone, keep those halos shiny and keep being holy. Thank you for listening to the Analuya podcast. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to keep up with all the latest information. We would love to hear your comments and questions about today's episode, as well as suggestions for future episodes. You can message us on our socials or email us at contact at 